In this section, we review important properties of the center of mass and how they inform us about rotational dynamics. To begin with, let's remind ourselves uh, how the center of mass is defined. If we have a coordinate system hanging arbitrarily in space somewhere, uh, and a mass with some funny arbitrary shape, the position of each element uh, of that mass alpha is given by r alpha. So this represents the position of the alpha if particle within that mass. The center of mass for the whole system is defined as this sum here. So basically you take each of the particles with their masses, multiply by the position vector for that uh, particle, make the sum, and then divide through by the total mass. And so this represents the mass-weighted average position for this system. If we have a, a system made not of discrete particles, but continuous particles, so uh, it's a, a solid system and not just a bunch of individual particles, this sum uh, turns into an integral that looks like this. And so we can define the position of any element within the system relative to the center of mass using this r alpha prime vector. And just simple vector arithmetic tells us that r alpha prime is the position of that element uh, with respect to our coordinate system r alpha minus the position of the center of mass for the system. And now recall from previous chapters that we can define the total momentum vector for our system as the sum of the momentum vectors for each of the individual elements of the system. And that momentum vector for each uh, element is, of course, given by this product here. And from the pre previous chapters, you can recall that this total momentum vector is just the total mass of the system times the velocity vector for the center of mass. And we showed in earlier chapters that uh, ex the net external force on the system will result in an acceleration of the center of mass. And so you can treat the whole system as if it were a, an infinitesimal particle located at the center of mass when you're thinking about the effect of external forces. And now let's think about uh, the system's total angular momentum. So again, here's our little uh, bean-shaped object. The center of mass is located at a position uh, capital R, and each element of the system is located at a position uh, R alpha. Then, of course, the, the position of each element of the system relative to the center of ma mass is R alpha prime vector. Uh, the R alpha vector pointing from the origin to each element of the system is given by the sum of these two vectors here. And so we can write the angular momentum of particle alpha as this cross product here, which is of course then equal to this. And so the total angular momentum for the system is just going to be the sum of the angular momentum for each individual particle. And so then that total angular momentum is going to be written as this sum. And as we'll see in a second, this sum uh, actually reduces to two terms, which allows us to express the angular momentum of the system as the angular momentum of the center of mass relative to our coordinate system plus the angular momentum relative to the center of mass. Let's see how that works. Again, our total angular momentum for the system is this. And we already know that uh, we've defined the R alpha vector in terms of the position of the center of mass for particle excuse me, in terms of the position of the center of mass for the system, plus the position of particle alpha relative to the center of mass. And so we can replace R alpha with this sum here. And then, of course, R alpha dot here is going to be this time derivative right here of the, the sum of these two vectors. Now you see that we have uh, the cross product uh, of between the sum of two different vectors. And so that should give us four different terms. So let's work out what those terms are. The first term, of course, is going to be this vector crossed into this vector. So that's this here. What does that term represent? That represents the position of the center of mass vector crossed into 
the mass of particle alpha, which is being multiplied by the velocity of the center of mass. Now remember, this sum is being taken over alpha, but these uh, vectors here, they actually don't depend on alpha at all. The only thing that depends on alpha here is the mass. And so we'll see that leads to some simplifications in a second. What about the next term? Well, now we have the vector representing the position of particle alpha relative to the center of mass crossed into the mass of particle alpha times the velocity of the center of mass. And again, this vector here doesn't depend on the sum over alpha. The next term, that's the position vector for the center of mass crossed into the mass of particle alpha times the velocity of particle alpha relative to the center of mass. Now, if we were dealing with a system uh, that was rigid, so that every element of the system was at a fixed distance from every other element of the system, what that would mean is this vector right here would have to be zero. In other words, the distance of particle alpha from the center of mass would be a fixed quantity. And in, a very, uh, in many cases, that's going to turn out to be true, but the derivation we're working through here doesn't require that. And so we could have systems in which the shape was actually changing over time, uh, and we'd have to include this term. And then finally, we have the position vector of particle alpha relative to the center of mass crossed into the momentum vector for particle alpha measured relative to the center of mass. And let's see how these things simplify. Here's our first term again. And remember that this sum only applies to the mass here. These two vectors are independent of the sum. They're just reflecting the position and velocity of the center of mass. And so we can take this sum and move it so that it applies only to the mass of particles alpha. When we do this sum, of course, m alpha, the sum over m alpha, just becomes the total uh, system's mass. And so then we have the position vector of the center of mass crossed into the momentum vector of the center of mass. And that is, of course, just the angular momentum of the center of mass. In other words, this term turns into uh, the uh, angular momentum of the center of mass as if it were an infinitesimal particle located at the center of mass. So this first term acts, uh, it, it turns into a, a term that really just reflects the motion of the center of mass as an infinitesimal particle. So for this term we can ignore the physical extent of the rest of the system. Of course, there are other terms that we'll see in a second, but this first term is pretty simple. Now, dealing with the second term here, again, this sum only applies to these two uh, elements of the sum, and so we can take capital R out of the sum altogether, and so we get capital R vector crossed into this sum here. Well, this sum here, that represents the same thing as the time derivative of this sum. So this is a sum over alpha, m alpha, times the position of particle alpha relative to the center of mass. In other words, what we're asking is, where is the center of mass located for this system relative to the center of mass? And of course, the center of mass relative to the center of mass, that's just zero. And so this sum here just works out to be zero. And so, of course, its time derivative is just zero. And so that means that the second term uh, in the calculation of the total angular momentum for our system is just zero. Coming to the third term, looks like this. Again, uh, sum only applies to this and this. Because uh, m alpha is a scalar, we can move it uh, from this vector here and append it to this vector over here. And so this sum turns into this expression. Well, this uh, term here should look very familiar. We just saw it. Again, it's the position of the center of mass relative to the center of mass, which is by definition zero, and therefore the third term is also zero in the total system angular momentum. And then we come to our last term, which is here. There's no uh, simplification we can apply for this. This term just reflects the system's angular momentum as measured relative to the center of mass. And so the picture you want to have in your head is this one. You've got our little system here, um, and we've moved, when we, when we use these R alpha prime vectors, what we're doing is moving our, our coordinate system to the center of mass, 
And then, of course, r alpha prime is just the vector pointing to particle alpha from the center of mass. And so this just represents uh, the angular momentum of the system relative to the center of mass. And so we see that the total angular momentum of the system just has these two terms. There's the angular momentum of the center of mass as measured relative to our uh, coordinate system outside of the body. And so that means that we're basically treating the entire system as an infinitesimal uh, particle located at the center of mass and asking what its uh, angular momentum is about our coordinate system. And then the other term is the angular momentum about the center of mass. And so what that means is we're transferring our coordinate system to the center of mass and then asking what the body looks like as it revolves about that center of mass. A good example of a system uh, where this approach is useful uh, is the Earth uh, in orbit around the Sun. So the uh, Earth's angular momentum vector consists of two parts. Uh, one, the angular momentum of its orbital motion about the Sun, L orb, plus the angular momentum of the Earth's spin about its axis. And so if we want to treat the dynamics of the Earth's rotation, we need only to think about that rotation in terms of its orbital angular momentum and its spin angular momentum. We can treat each of those two components separately. We get a similar simplification when we look at the kinetic energy for our system. So the kinetic energy for our system, made up of all these particles alpha, is of course just the sum of the kinetic energy for all of the different particles as measured relative to our external coordinate system. Well, we remember that r alpha dot squared, that's the dot product of the vector with itself. And so here's the vector once, and then we dot the vector into itself again. Of course, this gives us three different terms. The first term is the dot product of the center of masses velocity vector with itself plus the dot product of the velocity vector for each particle alpha measured relative to the center of mass plus the cross product where we're dotting the velocity vector of the center of mass into the velocity vector of particle alpha relative to the center of mass. We'll recall that the kinetic energy involves this sum here and so this term here, when we put it back into the expression for the kinetic energy, turns into a sum that looks like this. Remembering that the capital R doesn't depend on the sum, it's independent of the sum. And so what this term turns into is it looks like this. So we get a sum over m alpha, so a sum over alpha of m alpha times r alpha prime vector dot. Well, of course, this is the velocity of the center of mass as measured relative to the center of mass. And so, of course, that term is zero. And so this cross term turns out to just be zero. And so that we can write our kinetic energy as the kinetic energy of the center of mass plus the kinetic energy of the system about the center of mass. And so this is, again, a very useful simplification. If we want to think about the kinetic energy for our system, we just need to think about its kinetic energy uh, of the center of mass as if the center of mass were an infinitesimal particle located at the center of mass and then move to a frame where we're riding along with the center of mass and think about the kinetic energy uh, relative to that coordinate system. And then finally we can break up the potential energy for our system into two terms potential energy resulting from external forces plus the potential energy due to internal forces among the particles in our system Recall that the internal uh, potential energy can be written as this sum. Uh, and as we'll see in this chapter, very often we're dealing with uh, systems that are rigid, so that the, the distance between individual particles, alpha and beta, that distance remains constant. And therefore, very often the internal energy, the internal potential energy of our system uh, will remain a constant. And so it doesn't actually contribute to the dynamics of our system. So that's a very nice simplification here.